Three, two. Howdy, this is James Helm of Helm Enterprise, the Sporting Division, standing in my world headquarters in San Antonio, Texas. And just wanted to show an updated video of one of the two workhorses in my shop, my Power Hammer Gun Hilda. Because I have this Power Hammer, I'm able to work efficiently as a one man shop. I'm able to do everything from bush swords to axes to something that's a little more complicated in shape like this garden head. As all these all three were done using the power hammer to do the work. And it's been about a year since I got it in the shop. I've made a few changes to it and it works very well now. I just wanted to show everyone how it does. Okay, starting off, just a real quick overview of the basic mechanism. This is what is technically known as a guided helve hammer. And more specifically, it's a rusty style appellation hammer, which is a guided helve designed to be built out of scrap metal. So the helve portion is made out of truck springs. Any mechanical uh, hammer has to have a spring somewhere into the system to take up the shock. In this case, the spring is the helve, and it just pivots there on the bearings, back and forth, tilts up and down, and hammers. Now, it translates from the end of the spring arcing into a linear up and down motion through the use of these rollers. So the end of the spring moves in and out as it goes up and down and lets the ram move in a straight line up and down. The uh, guide is made from ultra high molecular weight plastic, which is very slick and has a better wear resistance than steel. I've also added a greasing system. There are channels machined into the plastic that lets the grease go all the way around the ram. And just every once in a while it needs a little bit of fresh grease. The ram itself now weighs approximately 100 pounds, not including the weight of the die. So it hits pretty hard, as you'll see later on in the video. There's a new die holding system than what I had last time. Works very well. It's a little different from anything that I've seen elsewhere. The dies are welded onto a base plate and then these keepers are machined with a slot that the base plate fits into. And you just slide the dies in and out. You gotta make sure you pull them straight but they just slide in and out and you can quickly change from one shape of dies to the other and then just swing the arm shut and bolt it put the nut on tighten it down very quick holds it in place means that you don't have to machine a dovetail onto your die also means that you don't have to try to get bolt holes to line up every time you make a new die like a lot of these homebrewed hammers use. Base plate and the drive mechanism. The motor sits on a hinge plate. As you step on the treadle, it swings up and the wheel contacts the spare tire. As you step off, gravity pulls it back down and disengages from the tire. Very simple, very elegant, works great. No springs involved like a lot of the systems have. It works very well. The clutch mechanism is a tire clutch. It gives good control. The harder you step, the more power is transferred and the harder and faster the hammer hits. The uh, softer you step, the lighter it'll hit, 
so you can actually feather it. This has better control than a slack belt clutch does. Um, a lot of these tire clutches are set up in such a way that they have to have welding done on the spare tire. This is very simple. We just built a little axle with a hub that bolts onto the tire just like it bolted onto the car. And then you have an eccentric wheel with the linkage that goes up to the end of the leaf spring. And in the middle of that, we have a turnbuckle. It lets us adjust the height of our ram. So if we have tall dies, or we're working on something that's tall, we need a lot of space between the dies, we can adjust it up. Or if we're forging something thin, we adjust it down. And it gives a lot of versatility to the kind of tooling that you can do and the kind of work you can do with it. Everything on here just about is built from junk. The rest of it is fabricated from new material or a few off the shelf parts such as the bearings. So everything can be replaced fairly easily if it breaks or wears out. Um, one more aspect, you see the wheel, the holes in the eccentric wheel, they allow the adjustment of the stroke. So the shorter the stroke, the faster it hits, the longer, the slower it hits. And this actually seems to work best on either the, the slowest or second slowest setting. You go faster than that and it actually hits too hard to do the kind of work that I do. And that's the basic overview of it. We're going to look at some of the more specific parts now. Okay, we're going to look at some of the dies that I have now. Originally I made dies for this out of pieces of railroad track. And they worked fairly well, but I think there were some flaws in them because they started to come apart after a while. So I invested the money in some good 4140 steel and had them rough shaped by a machinist and then cleaned them up the rest of the way myself and then heat treated them. So all these dies are made from new 4140. This set of offset fullers is probably what I use the most. I use them in my blade forging. The offset allows you to forge a blade out. So you start with a flat bar and you leave the spine on the side that gives more clearance and the edge towards the side that has less clearance. And as you forge, you just pull the steel towards the edge and work your way down. This also works great as a general drawing die. So draw something out in the length. You can also use the low clearance side to put points on the ends of blades or on the end of a bar. You can also use the clearance to smooth up the tapers. So you put the thick point of the taper down here where it has the most clearance and the thin point up here where it has the least and just gently run the hammer while rotating and it helps smooth up tapers. So these are actually very useful dies and they're what I use the most. I found that I can also spread out the steel to make my preforms for these integral socket handles. By working it back and forth, it'll spread the steel out this way and not so much this way. So I spread it out into the preform and then roll it around into the integral socket handle. But they're not the only dies I have. I also use these combination dies. These are fairly standard blacksmith power hammer combination dies where you have a narrow section and a wider section. And all kinds of uses for these, that's why they're one of the most common dies. <clears throat> these I will use to, for instance, spread out my axe blade on the narrow section of the fuller and then smooth it up on the wider section, take out some of the hammer marks. This is also how I forge the neck of the hoe 
I started with a wide piece of leaf spring and necked it down on the fuller, drew that neck out, and then forged out the blade over here across the length of it. So, also very useful knives. This little number is just a plain flat surface. This is just mild steel, it's not hardened. Um, but it barely pokes up above the die holder. So if I need maximum amount of clearance, I'll slip this into the bottom. I have one for the top as well, which means that it is possible to use handheld tooling under my hammer. Uh, it gives the maximum amount of clearance to be able to have your hot steel and have your handheld tool. It also is wider than the other dies. So if I want to be able to hit something and not pick up a sharp edge from the bottom die, and then I can use this. It's kind of similar to hammering on top of the anvil surface by hand. And then something that I haven't fully tapped into yet are these flat dies with the um, cap tooling available. They're held on with these pins. I have to knock them off with the hammer. I'll just grab the other one. So it's a flat die with holes bored through it. And then whatever kind of tooling you want, you can build and it'll slip over the top and pin it or bolt it in place. So, for instance, this one is very similar to hammering by hand. This is similar to the shape of a hand hammer. And it lets you forge a little more closely to what you do by hand than with some of these other dies. This one is a texture die. It lets you transfer this texture, which originally came from a very corroded, rusted, uh, railroad bolt, transfer that onto anything that you want to. So this one inch bar that was perfectly smooth, I got it hot, put the top die and the bottom die on like this, I rolled it as the hammer was running, and now I have a texture that looks very similar to the original rusted, corroded railroad bolt. So those are the only two dies like that that I've made so far, but there's every, all kinds of stuff that you can do with that. Uh, there's another fellow here on YouTube, uh, Gearheart Ironworks, that has a cap tool for his hammer that will let him forge one half of a pair of tongs in a single heat. You could have all kinds of fullers up here, all kinds of texturing, all kinds of jigs. So this is a very powerful kind of setup. So these are all the dies I have right now. I have some more that are like the wide section of this, but for the full length that still need the base plate welded on. Uh, I plan to make some that are narrow the full length. And that'll cover most of what I need to do as a blacksmith. What I have now lets me do much of what I need to do and with a little you know, a few more sets of dies, I'll be able to do pretty much anything that my skill will allow me to. So I've had this hammer about a year, as I said, uh, and I've grown to like it quite a bit as I've gotten it fully tweaked out, have everything rolling like it's supposed to. However, there are a couple things that I would change about it. Uh, the biggest one is that the anvil needs to be twice as big as it is. For a power hammer to be efficient, you need a 10 to 1 ratio minimum of anvil to ram weight. This ram started out at 88 pounds. The anvil is made up of two pieces of 6 inch by 5 inch bar, uh, however tall that is. The total weight 
ended up being 600 and some odd pounds. So even then it was too light for the 10 to 1 ratio. Then I added another approximately 10 pounds when I put this uh, new die holding setup on. So it weighs approximately 100 pounds now with a 600 and some odd pound amp. So it is not heavy enough. It should have two more posts like this as the amp. Um, the other thing is the base plate is a little thin. It's an inch and a half plate, but for the amount of force that's coming down, it's not quite thick enough and it flexes. So I'm losing some efficiency that way. However, overall, it works very well. Um, those are fairly basic changes. The design is sound. The original Rusty hammer had, I think, a 15 pound ram. So it could easily be scaled between a 15 pound ram on up to about 100 pounds, this is as big as I've seen. Very useful hammers, uh, more so I would say than the Little Giant style. It gives me a lot of adjustability up and down, it gives me a lot of control with the tire clutch. Um, it gives me a lot of versatility with tooling, I can change stuff out quickly. It does not give as much control as an air hammer would. I've been thinking about it though and I think that this design could be adapted fairly easily to an air hammer. You would replace the clutch and the eccentric with an air cylinder. Still leave the linkage, still leave a uh, turnbuckle, but replace it all with an air cylinder, set up your valving like you would in any other air hammer. It would end up being very similar to the new Kenyan style of hammer. And you know, it would allow someone, if they started out with this style of hammer, building it as a mechanical hammer, they could later on spend the money and upgrade it, or they could build it from scratch as an air hammer. So, very much liking the guided help. It's a very useful design. It can be built for a minimal amount of an investment, and it really lets you do a lot more work than you would be able to do on your own. Yeah, sure.